On 6th of July 2021, the Netherlands was rocked by the brutal assassination of one of the most well-known faces in Dutch media. Fears grew that the country's most prominent drug gang had shifted from traditional crime and gangland killings to a terror campaign aimed at destabilizing the entire country. The murder of Peter de Vries, a renowned journalist and justice campaigner, was seen as a turning point in the fight against drug crime. His killing in daylight on a street in the center of the capital by a gunman linked to a drug mafia boss in prison served no rational purpose apart from spreading terror. The underworld figure widely blamed for the assassination is Ridwan Tagi, an alleged drug baron who in the immediate aftermath of his cold-blooded murder and the race to catch the killers before they were out of reach of the police. At about 7.30 p.m., de Vries, dressed in a light tan suit, left the studio and walked out onto the narrow commercial street outside, the Lange Leidsedvostraat in central Amsterdam. He walked briskly down the brick-paved road, past diners at outdoor cafe tables, as he checked his phone. Just outside the parking garage where he had left his car, a man with a dark beard and tattooed neck was waiting. Five short pops filled the air. A cell phone video taken moments later showed de Vries lying on the ground, bleeding from the side of his face. At first, his arms were crossed loosely on his stomach. They then fell limply to his side. He's then rushed to a nearby hospital in critical condition. News spread across the city. Peter Elbeser, a reporter from new outlet ANP and de Vries's old friend, raced to the area by bicycle. It was chaos, he said. A blur of crowds, colleagues and police who had closed off a section of the street with barriers and tape. Within an hour of the shooting, a 21-year-old Dutchman named Delano Geerman, the suspected gunman, and a 35-year-old Polish man named Kamil Egiert, his suspected accomplice and getaway driver, were arrested approximately 30 miles outside the city. Later, messages recovered from their phones revealed that an unidentified man had texted them images of de Vries with the message, Get this dog. If you do it right, you may get extra money. Gearman and Egiert sent back video clips of them testing their weapons, a modified handgun and a machine gun. According to the Public Prosecution Service, they began shadowing de Vries about two weeks before the attack, tracing his usual route from the RTL studio on the Lange Leidsedvorstraat and into the parking garage. Immediately after the shooting, the suspects text an anonymous associate. Bro, that bullet shot right through him twice, Gearman wrote. Everything squirted. Nice, the unidentified man replied. That blood make everyone scream. While de Vries remained unconscious in the hospital, a bed of flowers appeared on the street where he had fallen. An anonymous group laid 4,000 white roses on a lion statue in the city's central dam square. The country held out hope that de Vries might survive. But de Vries never regained consciousness. On July 15th, he died. He was 64. It is 7.29pm on a Tuesday evening, when the alarm network P2000 starts to emit an emergency signal about a shooting in central Amsterdam. A man is bleeding on the street between Leitzeplein and Prinsengracht. Bystanders soon realize who the victim is. The Netherlands' most famous crime reporter, Peter R. de Vries. The man who normally exudes an aura of invincibility lies vulnerable. Some bystanders film him and send the images over the internet. A woman does the only right thing. She clasps his hand in hers, waiting for help. After just a few minutes, the Amsterdam police realize the magnitude of the incident they are dealing with. As a matter of urgency, a four-point action plan is initiated. De Vries must be taken to the hospital as quickly as possible. Bystanders must be kept at a distance. The forensic department must be able to conduct an investigation and the manhunt for the perpetrators must be launched. Agents are the first on the scene. While de Vries is being resuscitated in the street and ambulance personnel takes him to the hospital soon afterward, the telephone lines are red hot in the operations center. People call to say they heard five shots. Others say they saw the perpetrator. Based on eyewitnesses, the police are working on a usable description of the shooter. It must be a man with a slight build in a dark green jacket with camouflage spots and a dark cap. 
The alert will be distributed via the Public Service Office, Bergenet. The Operations Centre not only receives useful leads, but also a lot of misinformation. For example, bystanders mistook a running man across the Prinzengracht for the perpetrator. Teenagers jokingly distribute a photo of a boy who looks like the shooter. Others talk about the kidnapping of Sonia Holida. It all turns out to be wrong. There was immediately a lot of fake news, said police spokesman Jean Fransman. That resulted in a lot of extra work for us because everything had to be checked. In the real-time intelligence centre of the Amsterdam police, analysts view the jumble of reports and camera images. The shooter pretty much picked the worst place to make an assassination attempt. It is one of the busiest places in Amsterdam, and almost next to the Leinbahnsgracht police station, which is teeming with security cameras. In the meantime, an arresting unit, the Royal Netherlands Marechaussee and fast Audis from the infra-service of the national unit have been deployed. Based on signals, agents chase several people. Just after half past eight in the evening, the police chased an 18-year-old boy in East Amsterdam on foot. At the Hugo de Vrieslaan, he is arrested based on his description. However, he will be released the next day. On the A4 towards The Hague, the police are hunting presumably the right suspects. Near Leidschendam, right at the exit, the police jammed their Renault. Two men are overpowered. They turn out to be a 35-year-old Pole from Morik in Gelderland and a 21-year-old man from Rotterdam. According to Police Commissioner Frank Pau, one of them is the suspected shooter. During later house searches in Morik, Rotterdam and Teal, the police find money and ammunition. It would surely seem impossible for anyone to escape the scene of such a public execution. Gerrit van der Kamp, chairman of the ACP Police Union, appreciates the successful police operation. At the same time, he makes it clear that the location of the assassination almost guarantees discovery. The chance that you get away from that place unseen and unrecognisable is nil. It also says a lot about the perpetrators, that they felt so free. It means they will stop at nothing. The two men in question were facing life in jail, but in an incredible twist, the case was reopened shortly before the verdict. This was because a new witness had come forward and provided additional information about the crime. This led to further arrests of three suspects, one of which was already in prison in the Netherlands, and the others in Spain and Curaçao. The new witness told police in July that de Vries was killed because he, the journalist, helped the Crown witness in the case against the Moroccan man. He was referring to the fact that de Vries had become an official confidant to Nabu Bakali, a key witness in the Marengo case against Ridwan Tagi. The witness also said that Gierman, the alleged shooter, was due to receive €100,000 for the killing, while Egiert was promised €50,000 for driving the getaway car. It is not clear if they ever saw the money, as they were arrested within hours of the murder. The Dutch prosecutor's position was that the new information wouldn't affect the outcome of the case, but of course the defence lawyers would argue against that. You cannot claim that the statements are irrelevant, Egiert's lawyer Isa Seaman told the court. She argued the new information could impact sentencing, as it could provide a connection to whoever ordered the killing. The court initially discussed splitting the case and continuing with Gierman's verdict as planned. The witness apparently had very little to say about the alleged gunman. But ultimately, the three-judge panel concluded the cases were too connected and instead postponed the entire verdict to later in 2023. Regardless of whether it is proven that de Vries was targeted due to his role as a spokesperson for Nabil Bakali or as a journalist, many view his assassination as a direct attack on freedom of speech and democracy in the Netherlands. Shortly after he was taken to hospital, the country erupted into chaos. Politicians, journalists, lawyers, police officers and even the king were quick to identify the attack on de Vries as an attack on the country. Their concerns proved well-founded. Just over two months after de Vries's death, the media reported that security around Prime Minister Mark Rutte had increased following indications of a potential attack by criminals linked to the drug trade had been allegedly received by the police. Since de Vries's murder, many have been left wondering about the future of the role of the key witness and how this might change the manner in which the Dutch tackle organised crime. 
As the Marengo trial continues, Nabil Bakali will be subject to interrogation in a high-security courtroom in Amsterdam. Peter Schouten will serve as his lawyer and will undoubtedly mourn the empty courtroom chair where his friend Peter de Vries would have sat with him. Thank you for watching another episode from OCG TV. We are working hard behind the scenes to bring you more top quality content. It would really help the channel if you could like the video, turn on the notifications bell and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, take care.